invite you to turn with me this morning to the Gospel of Luke. We'll read the opening verses of the Gospel of Luke. We'll spend a a bit of time this morning and this afternoon in Luke's Gospel. This morning we'll read 1 through 25. Verses 1 through 25. Luke chapter 1, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, He was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John." And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared." And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Our text this morning, the opening verses of Luke chapter 1. I want to read those with you together. They're fresh in your mind. Luke 1, and we'll read 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. This is the word of God. Beloved in Christ our Lord, I want to start this morning by asking you a really personal question, but the good news is you don't have to answer. How is your faith? Do you ever struggle with doubt? Do you ever struggle with a lack of assurance, or perhaps you are a skeptic? You would describe yourself as a skeptic. You're not quite sure about this whole gospel thing. Someone once described doubt as a mosquito that buzzes around the edges of your faith. In BC, we claim not to have any bugs. Um, And so coming back to Ontario, we had to experience the mosquitoes again. It's a vivid picture, just this annoying, constant presence that you can't quite seem to get rid of. Does that describe your faith? Are you bothered by the mosquitoes that buzz around the edges of your faith? Well, I have good news for you, literally, good news, gospel news for you this morning and this afternoon. We're going to be spending some time in the gospel of Luke. And it's exactly Luke's aim in writing this gospel to deal with Christians, believers, and others who 
want greater certainty, who have, lack of, who have doubts and lack assurance when it comes to their faith. And he makes it absolutely clear in his opening verses, which we just read together. It's an important place to start when we tackle the Gospel of Luke. When I was in, in Langley, um, at the beginning of the year, I started this series on the Gospel of Luke. And I have to confess that I almost didn't preach on this passage. We just celebrated Christmas. And so I thought doing a series in the Gospel of Luke, we would just start after the Christmas narrative and go on. But then as I sat down to read the Gospel of Luke from the very beginning, preparing for that first sermon, I realized this is the, a very important place to start. Um, because the, the prologue to Luke's Gospel sets the stage for everything he's going to say throughout the Gospel. You see, when Luke wrote this, this book, they weren't using books the way that we have them. They used scrolls. And I wonder if the kids have ever tried to, to make a scroll. You take a piece of paper and you roll the outsides into the middle. If you consider a scroll, imagine a scroll, well, there's no place to have a, a blurb on the back cover. There's no place to have a, a fancy title. There's no place to have a table of contents. And so the opening sentence as you open that scroll serves as the title page, as the table of contents and the blurb on the back cover. Everything the author wants to communicate before you get into the book. That makes it pretty important for us to notice. And so actually, these opening verses don't just give us the theme for the sermon this morning, but they give us the theme for the whole gospel of Luke. And it's this, know Jesus with certainty. He wants us to know Jesus with greater certainty. So let's plunge right in. The first word we have to stop, he says, in as much. That tells us something right off the bat. I wonder if I ask you, how many of you use the word in as much this year yet? I suspect the answer would be none of you. In fact, the only reason I've used it is because I've preached this sermon a couple of times. It tells us something. Luke is a scholar. He's a historian. Actually, we know he's even a medical doctor from the Acts of the Apostles. And so he's giving us a particular kind of story. He doesn't begin in a galaxy a long time ago, far, far away. If he began that way, we'd know he's writing something much different. He begins with this, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. And maybe your eyes are glazing over already and you're thinking, wow, that's, that's quite the way to start a gospel, Luke. It's pretty good stuff if you're an academic, but what's he really saying? He's saying that many people have been writing narratives, stories of the things that have been happening. There's been some significant happenings in, in Luke's day, and, and he wants to set, and there have been many people setting down these events to paper, and he says they're telling things about the things that have been accomplished among us. And that word accomplished gives us a clue that he's not just talking about ordinary circumstances, he wants to focus on what God's doing. The Greek word there is a special word, it has to do with the events that God is orchestrating, that God is, has been busy, particularly busy in these days. He wants to tell you what God has been doing. He wants to tell you God's story. It's not just history, it's God's story. It's the fulfillment of God's plans and purposes. So according to Luke, many people have been writing stories, writing down these accounts of what God has been doing. Why is he telling us this? Why does he begin this way? Well, do we jump down to verse 3? It gives us the clue. It seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. He says, well, I'm going to give you my own account. I've been following all these things myself, and now I'm going to give you my rendition of what has been happening. Not because the other, the other ones are no good, but because he's going to give his own particular perspective, his own particular narrative. And he says he's writing an orderly account. Says, my account in particular is going to be an orderly one. If you know anything about Luke's gospel you'll know that he followed through with this. It's particularly orderly. Just think of the Christmas story. That's probably the most familiar to most of you, the Christmas story. How does it begin? Maybe you can even recite it. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be registered. This was the first reg registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria and so on and so forth. And if you look at Luke's gospel, there are these moments where he gives us these these, these names of officials, and he kind of stacks them up so that we can pinpoint just when things happened and who was governing at the time. But it doesn't just mean when he says orderly that he wants us to make sure that we can get our dates and, and times correct. He means he wants us to have the right perspective on the things that have happened. And that's clear from what he says about, about how he gathered his information too. In verse 2, 
He says, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. He says, listen, I've got, I've got sources. I'm not just sitting down in my, my office writing these th- things down from memory even. You have to picture Luke conducting interviews with people. Maybe he even sat down. We read that bit about Zechariah and Elizabeth. Maybe he even sat down with Zechariah and Elizabeth and said, so tell me, um, what, what happened? How did this, how did this story un- unfold for you? He sat down with the soldiers or with, with some of the Pharisees, with anyone he could track down to verify the accounts. People who had seen it, he says, eyewitnesses, people who had seen it with their very eyes. And he spent a lot of time, he says, with ministers of the word. And he's referring here to the apostles in particular. Luke's not just writing this on his own authority. He has the authority of the apostles behind him, the people who have been sent out by God himself to, to preach the gospel called to be ministers of the word is the phrase there. And and the word ministers is an important one. It it means servant. I don't know if you knew that about the word minister. It's not a, we we call ministers reverence, but but the the word minister is actually not a a term of reverence. It's a term for a servant. He's saying they were ministers of the word. They were servants of the word. They were stewards of what God had said and and done. And so they handed them faithfully to Luke and, and Luke, wrote them down in this gospel. He says he wrote them down, first of all, for a man named Most Excellent Theophilus. The way he refers to him means he was probably a wealthy Christian in the first century, a wealthy Christian, probably a a believer, but we're not sure. But he didn't just write it down for this man, Theophilus. He wrote it down for you and for me. The name Theophilus, if you know your Greek, means lover of God or beloved of God. I don't think that's a coincidence. Luke is saying it's not just for this man who happened to be named Theophilus, but it's for, this, for anyone who is loved by God and who, who loves God. It's a gospel that's written for you and for me. But why? Why is Luke writing another gospel? We've got three other ones. Why do we have four anyway? Well, here's where we get to the theme. Here's where the, the take-home comes. He says, I've got a particular aim with my gospel He writes at the very end of this section, he says, verse 4, he says, I'm writing that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Actually, in the the Greek, certainty is the last word of the sentence. Luke puts at the very end, he wants us to notice. He wants to end on on this note. He says, listen, the reason I want to write a gospel for you is so that you may have certainty about the things that you have been taught. He wants you to know Jesus with greater certainty. He wants you to be more assured of your salvation by knowing Christ more deeply. You see, we need to know the gospel, and we need to know that the gospel is true. We need to know that the things that happened in the, in the first century that Luke tells us about and that the other gospel writers tell us about, that they're actually happened in time. That, that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. That this isn't just some kind of pie-in-the-sky doctrine that somebody made up, but that Jesus was actually historically born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. That he wasn't just the son of Mary, but that he was the son of God and is the son of God. We need to know that he died on the cross. We need to know that he was raised from the dead. We need to know that he ascended, that he is physically in heaven, at God's right hand, as we speak, as we worship here this morning. We need to know that these things truly happened, that these are historical facts that Luke is telling us in his gospel. When I was preparing this sermon back in in January, I happened to pick up a book that that our oldest son Gabriel had received um, from somebody in the congregation, uh, an apologetics book, I forget the title of it, about defending the faith. And the first thing as I just opened the book providentially, uh, the chapter that I stumbled across was a chapter defending the accuracy of Luke's writings. The authors tell how scholars, especially liberal scholars, love to try poking holes in Luke's gospel poking holes in the history behind Luke's gospel. For example, in in the book of Acts, which is also written by Luke, uh, Luke calls these these city officials in Thessalonica, he calls them politarchs. Politarchs. You don't need to remember the word. Um, Just trust me, he calls them politarchs. And and archaeologists and historians had never seen this this Greek title before used in this area of of this time period. And so they pointed to Luke's narrative and they said, well, well, Luke is wrong here. There's no such thing as as a politarch. And so you, you can't trust Luke's narrative. 
And so if you can't trust him there, then you can't trust him anywhere. Well, since then, more than a dozen inscriptions have been found from that very area testifying to that very title. And so Luke's accuracy was, was, has been vindicated. Reminds me of, of how Luke describes the apostles here. He says, ministers of the word. That is, people who are servants of the word, people who, who place themselves under the word of God. But scholars and people who are too intelligent for their own good like to imagine that they can place themselves over the word of God. Imagine that we can determine what's true and, and what's not true, and that we become the highest authority. Maybe you've had your own conversations with people who love to, to take God's word and point out inconsistencies or, or what they perceive as inconsistencies and contradictions in the word of God. Or maybe that's where you are, are at yourself. And let me say this carefully and, and kindly this morning. There's an arrogance to that, that approach to God's word. Placing yourself over the word of God rather than submitting yourself to the word of God. Because it means that you've become the most important source of, of truth. Now in response we can do a few things. We can defend Luke's accuracy as that book did. And that's important work, the work of apologetics. But ultimately the problem is not so much an intellectual one. It's a, it's a heart problem. It's a refusal to submit to the word of God. It's a refusal to admit the, the truth that this is the word of God. But it would be a mistake if I were to simply leave it at this and say what Luke is really concerned about is that you know that these are true historical events. That he, he wants you simply to know that these things actually happened. That the most important thing is that we know that he got his facts straight. What does he want you to have certainty about? He wants you to be certain of what it all means. Is what what does it matter that this man was born in the first century? What does it matter that he, he lived this perfect life? What does it matter that he went to the cross? What does it matter that he rose from the dead and that he ascended into heaven? What's the significance of these things? He wants you to be certain, more and more certain, of the fact that if you believe in this man, who was at the same time true God, that his death is your life, that his perfect obedience is your perfect righteousness, we need to know that too. We need to know what it all means. We need to know so that we can truly believe. That's why Luke wrote his gospel. He wrote it for people who need to know that Jesus is the only way to salvation. That means he's writing for people who see Jesus perhaps as a, some kind of interesting teacher, a good man maybe. For people who haven't yet understood and accepted that Jesus is the son of God, whom God sent into the world to to save sinners. He's writing for you if you haven't sought refuge yet in Jesus Christ from the coming wrath of God against sin because it is coming. But he's also writing for people like me who know Jesus is the Christ, who've been steeped perhaps in doctrine from the very beginning of our lives, but who sometimes lack assurance and are bothered by doubts by the mosquitoes. Because we need to know. We need to know when we read the Gospels, we need to know when we read God's Word that it's true, that it's certain. Because we need to know Jesus with greater certainty. Too often we're like Zechariah. I don't think it's for nothing that Luke includes this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth immediately after his prologue. Because Zechariah serves as an example of somebody who needs greater assurance greater certainty. Zechariah was a, a righteous man, we're told. But he's the kind of believer Luke is thinking about because when the word comes to Zechariah and it notice that Luke calls it, or actually Gabriel calls it, good news, gospel. When the good news comes to Zechariah, what does he do? He doubts. He doesn't believe. He can't believe that the many prayers that he and Elizabeth have offered up day after day after day could possibly come true. He doesn't believe that his son will be the forerunner to the promised Messiah. We're often not much different, are we? We take the promises of God and we line them up against what we perceive to be the reality and we say, well, the two don't really seem to jive. We doubt how the two could possibly line up. Zechariah looks at his wife's barrenness and his old age. 
And he looks at the promises of God and he simply can't reconcile the two. How about you? You hear the good news, but it's hard to believe sometimes, isn't it? Some of us struggle perhaps with forgiveness. Is it really possible that God could forgive a sinner like me? Is it really possible with the things that I've done, and nobody else knows about them, but God knows everything. Is it really possible that that he could forgive those sins in my heart of hearts, the ones that nobody else knows about? Or perhaps your struggle is with the circumstances in your life. Is it really possible that with the difficult circumstances in my life that God could possibly be a good and a loving God? How do I put those two things together? That's the kind of man that Zechariah was. That's the kind of thing that, that, Zechariah is addre- or that, that Luke is addressing in his gospel. He says, listen, you need to grow in assurance. And, and the answer is to know Jesus with greater certainty. Too often we're like the disciples to whom Jesus had to say so many times, oh, you of little faith. Does that describe you in any way? How's your faith this morning? Does it lack a certain rootedness, a firm foundation? Do you long for greater certainty or greater assurance? I think if we're honest, then each of us would like to grow in assurance and certainty. Well, the Gospel of Luke was written for you. You see, you can trust what Luke says to be true and certain. Not because he was such a great historian, although he was that, but because what Luke is giving us is the very word of God. There's a passage in, in 1 Timothy 5, verse 18, where the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, For the scriptures says, Scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and, second quote, the laborer deserves his wages. Now, what's interesting about that passage is that the first pass- quote is from Deuteronomy, and he calls it Scripture. The second quote is from the Gospel of Luke. Paul has received the Gospel of Luke a few years, probably now he's writing to Timothy. And he already says, listen, this isn't just some good history. This isn't just some story of somebody who really did a good job in in tracking down sources. He says, this is the word of God. Paul says, this is the word of God. And so as we read the gospel, we need to remember what the apostle Peter says about the word of God. He says that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Luke spoke from God as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. God chose Luke for this purpose. He chose this first century doctor with a particular attention to detail. He chose this doctor with a particular ability to observe closely. He chose Luke to be this historian. God's hand and God's breath are all over the gospel of Luke. Maybe none of you sitting here this morning questions the authority of Scripture or that it's God's Word. After all, I suspect your pastor says it every time he reads God's Word, this is the Word of God. And you think, yeah, it is the Word of God. But have you ever stopped to let it sink in again? That this is the Word of God that is speaking. That when the promises of Scripture come to bear on our lives, that it's God himself who speaks them to us. Do you lack assurance? Do you want greater certainty? Well, hear the word of God. Go to the gospel of Luke. The gospel of Luke has the power and the authority to speak into our lives. This is truth with a capital T. In a world which has rejected the the possibility of truth, in a world which has rejected anything that can say that this is absolutely, ultimately true, God's word says, no, this is truth truth. You can trust it. You can stake your life on it. You can have certainty regarding it. This is the bedrock on which your faith rests. When I was a, a pastor in, in Langley, it, was, it wasn't uncommon to have go for coffee with members or have email exchanges with members who were, who were wondering and questioning certain doctrines that they struggled with questioning in their minds, especially the young people. I'm glad we had those conversations. They were very open, and and those were great moments. Please have those conversations with each other. Do not keep your questions and your doubts in in the privacy of your own home. 
But the question I always wanted to ask them, and the question I always needed to ask them and did ask them was this. Are you also bringing your questions to, to the Word of God? Are you, are you taking your answers and bringing them to the Word of God? You're not sitting off here in your little chair thinking to yourself and answering your questions by yourself, but are you taking them to the Word of God? If you can't wrap your mind around the doctrine of election, for example, which is not an easy one, what are you doing with that? Are you taking it to the Word of God? If you can't wrap your mind around the reality of hell, that a good God could send sinners to hell, what are you doing with that? Are you wondering it about in your own mind, or do you go to God's Word and seek the truth, capital T, of God's Word? Luke, remember, says there are ministers of the word, servants of the word. Be a servant of the word. Submit yourself to the word, even, even when it doesn't make sense to your limited creaturely mind. Don't make yourself God by standing over the word of God. Of course, doubts and, and, and lack of certainty and lack of assurance, it's not just a head thing. It's not just an intellectual thing. So often it's a heart thing too, isn't it? Our feelings don't match up with the truth of, of God's word. Well, God's word also answers our, our feelings and our fears, our deepest fears, the ones nobody else knows about. This truth outside of yourself, God speaks into our hearts the truth of the gospel. God says in scripture, he cannot lie. And so his promises are, you can stake your life on them. Here's the certainty of Luke's gospel. He says, the life and death of Jesus. That his life is, is your life. That his death is your death. All that he's accomplished, says Luke, from, from the beginning of his life to the end of his life, and, and now that he's accomplishing through his spirit in the church, this is the certainty of your faith. You see, too often our response to doubts and weakness of faith is, is to look at ourselves. We look at ourselves. We, we wonder, if, if, do I have enough faith? And let this, this sermon not lead you down that path to say, well, is my faith strong enough? Do I have enough certainty? Do I have enough assurance? It doesn't matter. Look, don't look to yourself. Or we wonder about our spiritual performance. Have I done enough? Have I been obedient enough? As though there's some kind of measuring rod that we can say, okay, this is the, the line. You've got to cross this line and then you're good to go. We spend our time navel-gazing and we never grow in assurance of faith. The reality is we're weak and we struggle. Oh, you of little faith, Jesus says to you. So how do you grow in the certainty of faith? You stop navel-gazing and you look at Jesus. You stop looking at yourself and you look out words of yourself and you look at Christ. You turn to God's word and you consider the person and the work of Christ. The answer is not, am I a good enough Christian? Do I have strong enough faith? But is Jesus a strong enough savior for me? And you know the answer to that one. I'm going to share something that was deeply encouraging to me and it continues to be deeply encouraging. It's a story of a Southern Presbyterian minister, Robert Louis Dabney. Perhaps the name is familiar to you. He was a, a pillar of the church, gospel preacher for, for all his life. And he, in 1890, he's on his deathbed, this, this staunch, firm Christian. And he finds himself struggling with doubt on his deathbed. And so he writes a letter to his, his friend, a man named Vaughn, and he shares his struggles openly. And, and Vaughn writes a letter in response, and that letter has been preserved. You can, you can read it today. If you want to email me after the service, it's a, it's a gem. And he asks Dabney, he asks Dabney to imagine a traveler who, who comes to this great chasm. And there, he has to get to the other side. There's a bridge going over the chasm. He's got to take this bridge. What does he do to determine whether he, or not he should have enough trust in this bridge? What does he do to determine if he should have the confidence to cross this bridge over this great chasm? Well, the answer is obvious. He looks at the bridge. He considers the bridge. He looks at it from every angle. He looks at the arches and the, the pillars and the piers and the buttresses and whatever other parts of the bridge there are. He considers them carefully. He examines the bridge. What doesn't he do? He doesn't stand at the, at the base of the bridge and close his eyes and, and think to himself, well, do I have enough 
faith and trust in this bridge to step out over this great chasm. He doesn't look at himself. He looks at the bridge. And if this bridge gives him some confidence as he examines it and he wants more confidence, what does he do? He goes back to examining the bridge. He considers it from other angles and he keeps studying the bridge. Then Vaughn wrote this. He wrote this. Now, my dear old man, let your faith take care of itself for a little while and you just think of what you are allowed to trust in. Think of the master's power. Think of his love. Think of what he's done, his work. That blood of his is mightier than the sins of everyone who has ever lived. Don't you think it will master yours? Stop looking at yourself and look at Jesus. Consider Christ. Is he a savior enough for you? You think you're the greatest sinner and you can't possibly be saved? Come on, look at Christ. Christ's blood is enough to cover the sins of an infinite infinite number of sinners. His blood is enough to cover your sins. Do you think Christ can't hold you fast and bring you to the end? He is the Son of God, and he has all power in heaven and on earth, and authority over every principality and power in the universe. He has enough power to carry you to the end. You want to grow in certainty and assurance? Look at Jesus. Consider Christ. Go to the Gospel of Luke and elsewhere in Scripture and and look for Christ in his word. See him there. Receive certainty through through the Spirit of God who breathed out this Gospel through Luke the doctor. The word of God is given as food for your soul so that you might grow and receive strength for day to day. Don't starve yourself. Sit under the preaching of the word as often as you can and pray. Pray constantly. Pray as as you open God's word. Pray for the spirit to feed your soul. Pray for the spirit to open your heart. Pray for the spirit to show you Jesus as you read his word. And pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastor as he battles it out in this study from week to week, writing sermons that proclaim the very word of God. And as you come into worship, pray for the spirit to open your heart to receive the preaching of God's word. And always pray to Jesus, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Amen.